Very good. <clears throat> Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunatu Sahavirjan Karavavahai Tejasvina Vadhi Tamas Duma Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Hi Chaitanyam Sarvagam Sarvam Sarvaguhakuhashayam Yat Sarva Vishayati Tam Tasmai Sarva Vide Namaha Very good. Good to see you all this morning. Um, I'm very sorry last week we cancelled uh, very unexpectedly and I apologize for that. Hopefully that won't happen again in the future, but be sure to check your email before you come to class just in case there happens to be a last minute cancellation. Welcome also to uh, all of the uh, students regularly attending this class online. We continue with our study of uh, this. Chapter 16 on Vupadesha Sahasri. We're coming towards the uh, end of the chapter. Just to set the context for today's uh, discussion, we ended the last class with one of, I think, one of the most brilliant little, if I can call it tidbit, to call spiritual teachings tidbit doesn't sound right somehow, but a little tidbit meaning, meaning half a verse uh, or, a, or a, short, a short saying uh, that comes from the Amrita Bindu Upanishad, which we taught here many years ago. You can find that on our, on our website. But that famous statement is Manushya Nam Karanam Bandha Moksha Yoho is Avidya Eva. I ignorance alone is the cause for bondage and moksha. For all people. Pardon me? Blindness. Pardon me? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, thank you. <laughs> you. That's absolutely correct. Well, I don't know why I said of it. Yeah. That's absolute. Thank you. Yeah. Mana ev. You notice I didn't start on the first word. That's a little odd. Mana ev. This is. I have to warn you. This is what happens when. My head is spinning a little bit, but and don't feel shy, <laughs> please. That's helpful. Mana eva manushya nam karanam bandha moksha yoho. I skipped the word and then put in the la wrong word at the end. The mind alone is the karanam, the cause, manushya nam for all people. It's a cause for bandha and moksha, bondage and moksha. And we've uh, talked about this at great length. This is, this is so central to the teachings of Vedanta, and it is so well expressed in that statement that I just nicely <laughs> messed up. Um, brilliantly expressed, and in so few words. Um, we can change some of the words to go to my guru's a favorite expression, he calls it a problem of self-non-recognition. The failure to recognize what we call the inner divinity, the failure to recognize your true nature as Satchirananda Atma, leads you to many wrong conclusions about yourself. In particular, it leads you to, if you don't know who you truly are, then you're likely to make mistakes. Like saying, I am male. I am overweight. How's that? <laughs> you know, whatever it is, I am getting old. I am getting dizzy. All of these things are wrong conclusions. And notice they're wrong. Some of them are wrong conclusions that, that cause suffering. I'm overweight. Oh, no. <laughs> what is my doctor going to say? Am I going to die early? It's, oh, this anxiety can come. My mind is spinning. Oh, no. How am I going to handle this? Identification with the body and mind, and not just body and mind, 
we can say, and you may have heard me say this, whatever you identify with other than yourself becomes a source of suffering. You identify with your car and you get a dent, it's like you got dented, not your car. You identify with your house and there's some problem with the house, you suffer. Or I think a great example for many of you who have raised a family is if you identify with your adult children, <laughs> you suffer <laughs> because they are not going to do exactly what you want to do and you get frustrated and you have, have problems. This is the problem of identification. Of course, the basic identification is identification with the body and mind. When you identify with the body, you own the problems of your body. When you identify with your mind, you own the problems of your mind. These teachings are meant to lead us to what, what I like to call healthy disidentification. That word healthy means we're not trying to ignore the problems of our bodies and minds, but we recognize that the problems of the body belong to the body and not to me. The problems of the mind belong to the mind and not to me. And then we respond in a mature, rational, objective manner in dealing with the problems. If your car has a problem, you take it to the repair shop. If your body has a problem, you take it to the doctor. If your mind has a problem, depends on what kind of problem, how you respond to that. You get the point. This is healthy disidentification. To distinguish it from unhealthy disassociation. Who cares? So I'm overweight. So I'm diabetic. I'm, so what if I'm diabetic? Why should I take these medications? I'm not diabetic, by the way. But you get my point. That kind of unhealthy disassociation absolutely leads to trouble. So we're after, we want to avoid unhealthy disassociation and cultivate healthy uh, disattachment. Detachment, healthy detachment, that's the word. Okay. With that introduction, we can pick up the thread where we left off. Bodhasyatmaswarupatvan, Bodhasyatmaswarupatvan, Nityam tatropacharyate, Nityam tatropacharyate, Aviveko pyanadyo yam. Aviveko pyanad yo yam samsaro nanya hishyate samsaro nanya hishyate good bodhasya atma sarupa twat that ta became na due to some grammar rules bodha here bodha can mean knowledge arsha bodha the bodha that is Arsha that comes from the ancient rishis, but here it means consciousness. Yeah. Words always derive their meaning from context. Bodhasya for consciousness, which is Atma Surupa, which is your true nature. Surupa twat, because consciousness is your true nature. Nityam continually Tatra there means with reference to, well, the context I think is probably mind, but we can broaden it out to mind and body. Tatra upacharyate. Upacharyate means to um, take something figuratively or casually, and to translate this properly, it means that your true nature, which is, con which is consciousness, gets upacharyate superimposed. Upacharyate does not mean <laughs> superimposed, but here that turns out to be a good translation. Your nature as pure consciousness gets superimposed tatra, will stay on mind or intellect. Now, what does that, that's a very true statement, it's also fairly abstract. What does it mean 
to say that you superimpose consciousness on your mind. The essence of consciousness, and remember we're not talking about some abstract principle called consciousness. We're talking about Atma Surupa, your true nature. What is your true nature? The simplest way of beginning that discussion is the one who knows what's going on right now. You. You are a conscious being, the one who knows what's going on. Who knows what's going on where? Well, we've had this discussion before. You know what's happening on around what's going on around you only indirectly by mean of your five senses. But you know what's going on in your mind directly. Both of these are known to you. The contents of your mind are known directly. What's going on outside of you is known indirectly by, mean of your, by means of your senses. So what does that mean about you? in your, as Atma Surupa, in your true nature, as consciousness, simply put, you are the knower. We'll start there. You are the knower of what's happening in your mind. You are the knower of what's happening around you. Good enough? Okay. Look at the, what happens, however. You are the knower Anything known to you is different from you, right? That's basic principle. Anything known to you, yeah, here's my pot, an object known is different from you. I know this pot, I'm different from this pot. I know this chair, I'm different from this chair. I know this body, things get a little fuzzy, <laughs> but where they really get fuzzy I know this mind, and I want to get very specific now. I know the sadness in my mind. I know, look, watch this. I know the pot. I know the sadness in the mind. I know the pot. The pot is not me. I know the sadness in the mind. I am sad. But to say, I know the sadness in my mind and conclude, I am sad, is like saying, I know the pot, I am a pot. You see the magnitude of the mistake, of the error. Anything known to you is not you. All the activities of your mind are known to you, the conscious being, the ultimate knower, we can substitute the word Sakshi here, awareful witness, conscious observer. And look what happens. You attribute your, your selfness to the mind. I know the sadness in my mind. My mind possesses sadness. I possess sadness and suffering is born. This is the essence of the problem, is superimposition, upacharyate. When your selfness, your nature as an awareful being, or simply nowhere, when, when, you, when you put your selfness and attach it to what is known to you, Massive confusion, as massive, and I want to repeat that, that metaphor because it brings out how, the, as I said, the magnitude of this confusion. I know the sadness in my mind, therefore I am sad. I know the pot in my hand, therefore I am a pot. That's how serious. This error is. Anything known to you is different from you, separate from you. And you can imagine, yeah, this is, this is a, a problem of such magnitude that it, 
it ends up causing all of the suffering in our lives. Let's continue here. Um, obviously, we need to be able to discern the difference between consciousness and mind. And we said before in an earlier class, that's not so easy <laughs> because consciousness and mind are like that. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's a, it's a problem of a huge magnitude and it's a source of suffering. But I didn't say it's always oh, just obvious. This one is obvious. <laughs> this one is not so obvious. Because there is not much proximity between me and the pot. But what is the proximity between consciousness and mind? Much harder to differentiate, to make that discernment. Discernment? The veka. Uh, that's the key here. So, how, do, how does this happen? In fact, this is one of our questions for our, our uh, satsang question and answer session. Avi vekaha api anadyaha ayam samsaraha. I am samsaraha. Samsara referring to worldly life, that which goes on and on and on. The literal meaning of samsara is that which keeps going and going and going. But there is a certain spin we need to put on this. It's like that which goes on and on in an unpleasant <laughs> manner. Like someone droning on, like if I start droning on and on. How about how about if I spoke in a, in a uh, voice like this and I didn't change my voice at all and I go on like this for an hour. <laughs> and <laughs> after an hour, you would say, this is samsara. <laughs> it's just going on and on and on. <clears throat> so this reference to life is a ref samsara is a reference to one life after another life after another life, but the spin that we have to put on it. It's one life of suffering after another life of suffering after another life of suffering. So I am samsara, huh? this cycle of worldly lives, which is full of suffer suffering, is avivekaha, it is non-discernment, and I'm kind of being very technical right now in, in translating these terms. It is the inability to discern the difference, not the difference between me and a pot, the difference between consciousness and mind. This is Vedanta, and this is why self-inquiry is the focus of his teachings. It's also why meditation is so important as an adjunct, because we have to deal with our minds. So, the inner of Viveka here means the inability to discern the difference between where you end and your mind begins. Again, not easy <laughs> because of, of this problem of of being interwoven, this problem of proximity. Now, people will, will ask, how, how did we get in this... People will ask, how did we get in this samsara, the cycle of birth and rebirth? How did we get in it in the first place? Everyone loves to ask that question. So much so that I put out a video. The title was a video. It had to do with the fact that there was no first place. There, this has been going on infinitely. There was no first birth. There was no first creation. There was no first universe, if we think of a u cyclic universe, and I'm just amazed. Um, there was a comment on that very video, and the comment was, but you haven't answered the question, how did this all start in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> the whole video <laughs> is making the point that it is 
beginningless. In our verse, you can see the, if you break out the word api, then you see the word anadyaha. Anad, an, anadi, actually anadiyaha. Anadi? No, anadya. Anadyaha. Yeah, anadyaha. Beginningless. Anadi means beginningless. Here, due to some grammatical changes, anadyaha, it is beginningless. Beginningless means you, there was no first cycle of creation. Beginningless means you had no first birth. Beginningless means, and so people think this, how did I forget my true nature? You didn't forget your true nature. Every time you're born, are you born enlightened or ignorant? That's it. And the struggle people have, and, and I understand the struggle, we're not used to dealing with concepts of beginninglessness, infinity. Maybe mathematicians and, uh, and people studying physics and other research, maybe they can handle it. You can handle it too. You know, if they can understand infinite, you can also understand infinite, that which is beginningless. We've had this discussion before. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it's, and if you don't understand it, then go watch that video. The f we have to learn how to handle this concept of beginninglessness. So this aviveka, this misunderstanding, is anadyaha, anadi, beginningless. It didn't start, didn't start with this birth, didn't start with any birth. You didn't forget, you didn't, you didn't one day get stuck in this world of, of uh, samsara. It is beginningless. Now, good news is that it has an end. And here's a little, well, should bring that in here. I didn't think about it. But generally, that which is, that which has a beginning has an end. That which has no beginning generally has no end, generally. So, and, and th this is actually a very sophisticated topic. Let me let us not spend too much time on it. But if you think of time and space, they actually have a beginning. 13.8 billion years ago, before the Big Bang, there was no such thing as time and space. Or from a, from a Hindu point of view, when this universe was an an unmanifest condition following the pralaya, the dissolution of the prior universe, during that period in which the universe was unmanifest, the state of dissolution, there is no time and space. So even time and space has a beginning. So then what is beginningless where did that unmanifest universe come from? Well, came from the prior manifest universe. <laughs> Where did that prior manifest universe come from? Maybe from the prior unmanifest universe. <laughs> and you can see how we create a cycle very easily from that. So we see the cycle of universes as being beginningless. How did the cycle come into existence? You see the problem with that question? <laughs> when did this, when did this, people will ask, when did the cycle begin? That's like saying, where did a circle begin? If you look at the figure of a circle, it has no beginning. So if you say, when did this cycle begin? It didn't begin. This is what we mean by beginningless. Ishvara is the cause for that cycle. 
But it's not like one Thursday morning, Ishvara woke up and created that cycle. So that cycle of creation, we would say, and pardon the technical words here, the cycle of creation is co-eternal with Ishvara. Does that make a little sense? The cycle of creation is eternal, Ishvara is eternal. So, Ishvara doesn't have a birth date, right? Okay. Sri Krishna may have a birthday, <laughs> but Lord, but Ishra itself has no, no birthday. Now, that in mind, that which has no beginning should be endless. With one and only one exception. This is logically, it's, it's kind of surprising when you get this. There is only one thing that we know of. I don't know about things we don't know of, but one thing we know of that has no beginning and has an end. Some of you have figured this out. We've talked about it before, and it's ignorance. Ignorance has no beginning. If ignorance had a beginning, it means it would have to be preceded by something other than ignorance, right? Something other than ignorance is knowledge. <laughs> How can ignorance be preceded by knowledge? So by definition, ignorance is beginningless. That beginningless ignorance can be destroyed by knowledge. This is the solution to the problem of bondage that, that Vedanta offers. This beginningless ignorance can be put to an end with knowledge. And not any kind of knowledge, we're talking about ignorance of your true nature, as Satchitananda Atma, so knowledge of your true nature as Satchitananda Atma, destroys that ignorance and puts an end to suffering. Okay, next. <coughs> Mokshas tanha shaheva syan Mokshas tanha shaheva syan Nanyatana nupatitaha Nanu Anupatitaha Yesham Vastwantara Patir Yesham Vastwantara Patir Moksho Nashas to Tire Mataha Moksho Nashas to Tire Mataha Vastu Antara, not Antara, I mispronounced. All right. So, prior verse talked about bondage, bondage due to beginningless ignorance. And then what is moksha? Moksha tan nashaha. Moksha is the destruction of what? Aviveka, that failure to discern the difference between consciousness and mind. We can put it positively by saying moksha is, is destruction of ignorance, but this is, I think, more, more um, it's one more step. Moksha is the destruction of ignorance when you know yourself to be Satchirananda Atma, then you know you are not your mind. Notice that these two, these two, uh, um, we can say avidya and aviveka. Avidya means ignorance. Aviveka means this absent, absence of discernment between consciousness and mind. Notice they're different things, right? Ignorance means not knowing. Failure to what Puja Swamiji called self non-recognition. That is avidya. But due to avidya, this aviveka takes place. So we can say that due to avidya, self non recognition, aviveka takes place. When avidya, self non recognition, is removed, what happens to aviveka? 
when you remove the ignorance that causes the aviveka, the aviveka goes away. When, to go back to our common rope snake example, when you know it's a rope, do you have to make a second effort to get rid of the snake? It just goes. Knowing it's a rope makes the wrong conclusion go away. Knowing that you are Satchirananda Atma makes your identification with the body and mind go away and solves the problem. So Mokshaha Tanashaha Evasyat. Moksha is the destruction of ignorance. Na Anyata Upapatitaha. Oh, there's a point I wanted to make here. Um, a ni nice, nice observation. Um, we've said in many, many other classes that Atma is unchanging. If, at, if you accept that, and we, we've gone through lots of logic and teachings to establish that Atma is unchanging, if Atma is unchanging and Atma is bound <laughs> to a life of suffering, if Atma is in a state of bondage, what's the solution? I've joked with you before, the solution is go to the bar and drink lots of alcohol and try to forget about all, <laughs> about all this, <laughs> because there is no solution. Fortunately, that's not the case. Atma is unchanging, but the nature of Atma and Shankara loves the expression nitya mukta, eternally free. Atma never got into a state of bondage. Mana eva manushyanam. It's the mind that's the cause for bondage and liberation, not Atma. Okay, that being said, moksha then is the destruction of ignorance. When, when, when ignorance gets destroyed, what happens to Atma? You would say, kuch nahi. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. When you die, what happens to Atma? When you're born, what happens to Atma? When your house burns down, what happens to Atma? When you get diagnosed with cancer, what happens to Atma? This is how Vedanta frees you from suffering, is when you know that you are unchanging consciousness. Okay, so at, uh, moksha then is the destruction of ignorance. Na anyata, it cannot be otherwise. An upapatitaha, because it is unreasonable for moksha to be anything other than the destruction of ignorance. And this refers to our prior discussion, and that is, it, does atma become liberated? That was, I think, in our prior class. So here, Shankara says, atma does not become liberated. The mind is freed from ignorance, and that freedom from ignorance is moksha. But previously we, descri we discussed at atma becoming liberated, and he says that is anupapatti, that is unreasonable to make that conclusion that atma becomes liberated, and we've gone through that at great length. We'll just give a couple of quick references. One we just talked about, and that is atma is unchanging. <laughs> That which is unchanging cannot become liberated. Or the other uh, more, uh, I think in our last class we talked about, if Atma has to become liberated, you have to do something to liberate Atma, which means some kind of doing is involved in liberation, some kind of karma is involved in liberation. What kind of karma? Remember we had those four kinds of karma up on the board? What do you have to do to make atma free? 
What do you have to do? And that's such a normal American kind of attitude. Tell me what to do. <laughs> you, know, you go to the spiritual teacher, tell me what to do. And the t teacher, this is kind of like a joke, you t and the teacher says, just sit there. And, they go, and the typical American s student says, yeah, but what do I have to do? <laughs> because there's such a focus on doing, such a focus on doing that, that another joke that goes along with this topic is, are you a human being or are you a human doing? You get the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is that becoming liberated is not the result of karma. And we gave four different kinds of karma and we concluded none of them. I don't want to go back to the four kinds. That's, uh, we've already discussed that at, at length. But we could kind of summarize it by saying this. Moksha is an ultimate achievement. To make this, to make, to achieve anything requires a certain amount of effort. You remember this argument, right? For a small result, you need a small effort. For a bigger result, you need a bigger effort. How much effort to gain moksha? Following that reasoning, it would be an infinite effort, which is not possible. That's why Shankara uses this word, anupapatti, which means illogical, unreasonable. Okay. Um, somebody might object here, saying, wait a minute, Swamiji. I don't know, have any of you had this, this doubt? Isn't gaining knowledge kind of an intellectual action? If you didn't have the doubt before, <laughs> <laughs> you might have it. Now, we've been talking about how enlightenment is not the result of an action. I've just put a doubt in your mind. Wait a minute, isn't gaining knowledge kind of an action? After all, you, you, coming here to class was an action. Reading this text is an action. Listening to my words, you're paying attention. These are all mental activities. These are all mental actions. So then you might ask this question, isn't attaining knowledge a kind of action? Now this is like a technical question, and technical questions get technical answers. <laughs> so isn't gaining knowledge an action? Well, right now you have knowledge that I'm sitting here. There was action involved in coming here. There was action involved in opening your eyes. And if I drone on and on and on like this, it may take some action to keep your eyes <laughs> open, some effort to keep your eyes open if I start droning in a monotone voice. But look at this. You're sitting here, your eyes are open, that being so, what do you have to do to see me? That's not an action. There are actions that prepare you to see me, but seeing, and this is a metaphor, seeing is not an action. It happens in the same way gaining and seeing means gaining knowledge of my presence here in this chair. It's not an action. Opening your eyes, driving here, everything else, action. But the act of, can't call it the act of seeing. <laughs> that would be to contradict everything I'm saying. Seeing is not an action. Knowing is not an action. Discovering your true nature as Satchitananda Atma is not an action. Okay, technical question with a technical answer. Last part of this verse. Yesham vastu antra apatihi mokshaha. But though, uh, yesham, for those who think that 
that there is a, the apatti, the gaining of vastu ant antara here means change. That atma here is the vastu, the thing that we're talking about. So yesham, for those who think that atma undergoes some kind of change, atma is bound, atma becomes liberated, some kind of change. Those who think, for those who think, atma, hmm, atma becomes Brahman. Many people say that, right? Atma merges, and we talked about that before, Atma merges into Brahman. Atma becomes non-separate from Brahman. Atma is already non-separate from Brahman. And you can't merge into that from which you're non-separate. That merging is a funny American expression. It's a done deal. <laughs> It's an already existent fact. So there's no, there's no transformation but yesham. For those who have this wrong conclusion that atma has to go from a state of bondage to a state of liberation, then for them, mokshaha is nashaha, taihi. Taihi mataha, due to their wrong conclusion, Moksha is nashaha. Moksha is destruction. Destruction of Atma. <laughs> and here's the point. Anything that changes ceases to be what it used to be. So when you make this, uh, this yogurt, dahi, what happens to the milk? <laughs> you destroy milk to make yogurt. You destroy atma to convert it into Brahman. This is the consequence of that wrong conclusion. So there is no, no transition for atma, but for the mind. Mind, no, I can't, that's in the next verse. We'll just see one more today. Avastan taram apyevam, avastan taram apyevam, avikarana yujjate, avikarana yujjate, vikare vaya vitvam syat, vikare vyaya vitvam syat, tato nasho ghatadivata. Tato nasho ghata divata. Avasta antaram eva, evam, api evam. That, that avasta, avasta, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> avasta means state. Avasta antaram is another state. Api evam, <coughs> if that is the case, that moksha is another state, then na yujyate, that is not reasonable, that is not logical, why avikarat? Same thing you said in the prior verse, atma is unchanging. So an unchanging atma doesn't go through various states. This word state is, is problematic in spiritual life. The, the Sanskrit word is avastha, and it's, state is a correct translation. I can't think of a better translation for avastha. It is a state. But then state of what? When we speak of the states of waking, dream, and sleep, states of what? And this is where we get into trouble. Because so many people cling to this wrong idea that these are states of consciousness. But look at the problem. Consciousness is Atma. If Atma goes through different states, what is this? 
Shankar has been telling us for three verses now, moksha is unchanging. Moksha undergoes no change. There's no change of state from liberated, I'm sorry, there's no state of change from being in a state of bondage to a state of moksha, which means there can't be a state change for consciousness, going from waking state to dream state to sleep state. Consciousness does not change states. Consciousness has no states, as you've heard me say before. These are states, however. Waking state, dream state, deep sleep state. Whose state? States of what? You can call them states of experience. Absolutely fine. You can call them states of your mind. Equally fine. They are conditions of your mind. There are kinds of experiences, so waking, dream, sleep, and then they talk about Turi. It will come to Turi <laughs> in just a moment. So these three states are states of your mind. They are states of experience. They are not states of unchanging consciousness, which can have no states. Then people say, what about Turi? What about the fourth? Fine, it's a fourth, but it's not a state. <laughs> Just as these, if these three are not states, then how can you say fourth is a state? Then you, you so the fourth, Turiya, refers to consciousness itself. So if you have three non-states of consciousness, well, that sounds weird. <laughs> three non-states of consciousness and a fourth non-state. <laughs> and you get my point. No states. Then what about samadhi, state of samadhi? Absolutely, state of mind, <laughs> state of experience, not a state of consciousness. All right, oh, no, you jete. Oh, that's interesting. You made an interesting note here. States go on changing. Waking, dream, sleep, waking, dream, sleep. When does that stop? You say, at death. But then you get reborn and then it starts up again. So really speaking, you know, any, any state will go on changing. If you're in a state of samadhi, that comes to an end. If you're in a state when you're not in samadhi, then you can go into samadhi. So in general, states... States have an end. By the way, this is another technical issue. This class, by the way, you, you already know this very well. This is, we're not treating this as a beginning class, so it gives us some opportunity to bring up some of these more difficult questions that people have. And one question is this. If we define moksha as a state, and it's a state of what? State of the mind, mana eva manushyanam. So if moksha is a state of the mind, and if states of the mind go on changing, oh, oh, right? Then moksha should also be one more changing state of mind. Last night I slept for eight hours. And today I've been enlightened for about four and a half hours. <laughs> Stupid, right? Silly. So, there's something unusual about the state of ignorance and the state of enlightenment. We said before, moksha is the destruction of ignorance. When ignorance is destroyed, does it come back? So right now you see me. Close your eyes. Am I gone? <laughs> you still know I'm here. Even with your eyes closed, you know I'm here. My point being is once you have knowledge of my presence here and the ignorance about my presence here has been destroyed, that ignorance, that particular ignorance, is not going to come back. Ignorance doesn't come back. In, 
in India, they have those dowels with the weighted bottom, and you push those dowels over, and then they pop up again. What are those called? Weeble. Weeble? Okay, they have a different name in India. Anyway, you call them what you want. Anyway, you can imagine a doll with a rounded body bottom and the weight in the bottom. You push the doll over, it comes back up. Push the doll over, it comes back up. Is that how ignorance works? You destroy it, it comes back. You destroy it, it comes back. In your own experience, that's not the case. Then one more question. But Swamiji, what if I forget? Another good question. What if I forget? Tell me, when have you forgotten who you are? Did you have somebody ask your name? What is your name? Um, I forgot. <laughs> and you've heard me joke before. When you wake up in the morning, do you have to go and look inside, the, look at the mirror to remember who you are? You don't forget who you are. You can forget something other than you. You can forget something else. You can't forget the forgetor of that. <laughs> you, your essential nature. So ignorance doesn't come back. You can't forget who you are. So therefore, even though moksha can correctly be called a state of mind, even then it is a permanent state of mind, unlike any other state of mind, because it is due purely to the removal of ignorance. That's not true of other, other states of mind. But for moksha, uh, removal of ignorance, ignorance doesn't come back, so moksha doesn't get lost. All right, last part. Oh. Vikare avayavetvam syat tataha nashaha gatadivat. This is part of a bigger issue because this is verse 63. Next verse we're seeing is 69. So we're coming up to a segment that, I, that we're omitting. And we're omitting segments that deal with other schools of thought, schools like what's taught in Vaisheshika Mata, what's taught in Sankhya Mata, what's taught by the Buddhists. By the way, in commentaries, Buddhists are not called Buddhists because Buddhist is an English word. Ist, right, is not Sanskrit. So in, in Sanskrit they are called Baudha. So the Baudhas. We're coming up on, a, on, a, on the number of verses we've omitted because it goes back to some earlier discussions uh, about Sankhya, Vaisheshika, and, and Buddhism that we've omitted. But this last half of verse is connected to that discussion. Since it's here, you're going you're gonna to get a little, little peep into the world of Vaisheshika teachings. Just a little peep. This introduces the next verse. So what about Vai Vaisheshika is one of the more logical schools of thought in ancient uh, India. And here, the logic goes like this. Vikare, vikare avayavitvam syat. If vikare, if atma undergoes change, it does so. Why? Avayavitvat. Avayava is a part. Avayavi is that which has parts. Here's this, and here you have, we give you a five minute lesson on, on Vaisheshi, on one little tidbit, another tidbit. Of Vaish this one on Vaisheshika Mata, and we'll end the class with this, but I think you'll kind of enjoy getting a little taste of what some of these other schools of thought are about. So, according to the Vaisheshikas, ancient school of thought, everything is made of atoms, paramanus. Paramanus, space, air, fire, etc., these five basic elements, 
And then, it, in fact, it sounds very scientific. You take these five basic elements, and first you stick two of them together and create what's called a dyad. And then you stick some dyads together and you can create a triad. And then you can stick more together and more together and more together. You keep sticking things together and eventually you have created the universe. This is the cosmology of Vaisheshika Mata. And the point here is that anything made of parts falls apart. <laughs> you know that very well. <laughs> our cars are made of parts, they fall apart. Our bodies are made of parts, they're constantly falling apart. And just logically, if things were made of, if, of no parts, then a, a non-part, that which has that which is unitary. In fact, there's the word for that is monad. A monad can't fall apart. A single billiard ball could be considered a monad. That billiard ball can't fall apart. But if you stick two of them together with some glue, you can probably break the bond of that glue and break them apart. If you stick three billiard bar balls together, Thousands and thousands. This is a uh, Vaisheshika thought. This is how they see the world as being an assemblage of millions of parts. These parts called paramanus. And here's the problem. If Atma undergoes change, it does so because it's made of parts. According to the Vaisheshikas, change is due to parts coming together and parts falling apart. If there were no parts coming together or coming apart, nothing would change. But according to the Vaisheshikas, parts come together, form dyads and triads, and parts fall apart and become monads. So according to Vaisheshika, change is a change implies parts. And parts implies change. These two are two sides of a coin. Wherever you have parts, you have change. Wherever you have change, you have parts. How many parts does consciousness have? In your own experience, right now, consciousness is present. Now, if, if you say, what, what happens though you're listening to me, and then in the background, you're thinking about what you have to do when you get home. <laughs> By the way, our brains are surprisingly well-designed for multitasking. Incredibly well-designed. for. It's entirely possible to think about doing two things at a time. Think about a musician. In fact, you know, playing piano? Think about the fact that what the left hand is doing and the right hand is doing is completely different. How do they do that? If you practice, it's easy. <laughs> our mind, our brains are designed for multitasking. It's a skill you can learn. So, if that's so, then you should be able to pay attention to the class and simultaneously think about something else. No problem. In fact, one kind of, my, of a very common kind of multitasking is when you're doing japa. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. And what are you thinking about at the same time? <laughs> a zillion other things. Notice Om Namah Shivaya never comes to an end. But you're thinking about so many other things. Multitasking. But now the question is, who is multitasking? Multitasking means a kind of duality, different parts. One part is chanting Om Namah Shivaya. One part is planning what you have to buy at the market when you go shopping today. These are different parts. But tell me, are they different parts of consciousness or different parts of your mind? There you have it you're actually aware of these different parts. <laughs> the one who is aware of these different parts has no parts. 
consciousness is partless, since consciousness is partless, it is changeless. By employing the logic of Vaisheshikas. So this is the introduction of some, some Vaisheshika. They relate change and parts. So the argument according to the Vaisheshikas is Atma must have parts. And if Atma has parts, it must undergo change. Our response is, what parts does consciousness have? What, div what internal divisions does consciousness have? Even external divisions. Where does my consciousness end and your consciousness begin? We've discussed that before. One all-pervasive consciousness, and that one all-pervasive consciousness is necessarily partless. So our response to the Vaisheshikas is, they say Atma has parts, therefore it is subject to change. We say Atma has no parts, therefore not subject to change. But if Atma did have parts, tataha nashaha. In that case, it would get destroyed, according to the Sankhyas. If Atma has parts, tataha nashaha, then it would certainly be destroyed gatadivat, just like a pot. A pot has parts. How? These are, this is not a monad, right? It's made of dyads, made into triads, made into more and more and more until it all comes together to create a pot. This is not a monad, this is made of parts, therefore it can fall apart, we can drop it and see it fall into shards. So this is the logic. If Atma indeed had parts, it could fall apart like this pot. Okay. Good place to conclude for today. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschadukha Bhagbhavet Tamaso Ma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat.